Hi everyone and welcome to episode 9 of Teach Tech Play. I'm Eleni Karitsis and I'm one of the co-hosts along with Michael. We'd like to welcome you tonight to our Aussie and New Zealand special. So after the Easter break we had to change the date of our episode to one week later so we hope that it hasn't been an inconvenience for anyone but we know we've got a great line of presenters ready to share some great tools. Just a reminder to get everyone to vote. Um, last month our winner was Phil Stubbs with the Verso app and I know I've implemented Verso since then and the students absolutely love it so make sure you get on board. So thank you to all our episode 8 presenters. So Michael I'll throw over to you and you can say a big hello. Hi everyone, um, yes I'm Michael, the other co-host of Teach Tech Play and I just want to say a big thank you to Steve and Lemfer for for um, staying up and, and I'll show you. I know um, the last couple of episodes we've been having people waking up early from the States and this time we have um, presenters staying up late, so very excited. Yeah, it is always great getting um, worldwide presenters. Um, yes, it is 10 o'clock in New Zealand, so we don't want to keep you guys too late, but we do appreciate you being part of it. So we might throw over to you, Steve. Would you like to introduce where you're from and what you do? Yeah, hi. Hi. Um yeah, Steve Moldy, I'm at Hobsonville Point Secondary School, which is the newest secondary school in New Zealand, and we are sort of building up year by year, so so far we've sort of only got two of the five high school year groups um, building up through it, and my role is as sort of curriculum and learning design, which goes across the curriculum. Wonderful. Thank you, Steve, for sharing what you're doing. I know you're doing some absolutely fantastic things down in New Zealand at Hobsonville. Um, Corey, would you like to introduce where you're from? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, g'day. So my name's Corey Barclay. Um, I'm the educational leader for digital learning um, down at Northern Bay College down in Geelong. Um, so just south of Melbourne by about an hour. Um, we've got a little over 2,000 kids, I think, over five campuses, which is uh, quite a challenge. Um, my role primarily is to work with as many teachers as I can squash into a day um, and, and try and help them improve their capacity to, to use the technology but also working with the kids to do the same thing. So it's certainly a challenge but it's, um, it's great fun. Wonderful. I know we were discussing prior to the show that you know we're always so busy but it's part of the job and we do love what we do. So thank you Corey for being here and Lenva, would you like to introduce what you do? Yeah, thanks. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Lemba Shearing and I'm the lead educator for Harpera Teacher Dashboard and Harpera Teacher Dashboard based um, in the United States and in New Zealand. Um, I'm uh, the lead educator in Australia, New Zealand and Asia so um, I spend a lot of time talking to people about how to, make, how to manage their Google Apps. Previous to that I was Deputy Principal at um, Buckland's Beach Intermediate School, a large middle school out east of Auckland. Wonderful, thank you. So I know we've got some fantastic presenters and a whole range of tools that you'll be able to implement um, into your classes. So to get us started, it's Steve. So Steve, when you're ready, let us know and I'll um, start the timer. Uh, yeah, we are ready to go. Alrighty, your time has started. Okay, so yeah, I'm talking about GeoGuessr, first of all, which is a game I'm sure lots of people have seen over the last couple of years, um, simply geoguessr.com, and basically it gives you shots from uh, Google Street View, and basically the point is to have a look around and see if there's any clues, and so within this one you can um, sort of move back and forwards, have a look around. There's a 50k sign which doesn't really tell you much, but then you can have a look around and then it's a case of having a look on the map and saying where you think it is, click where you think it is, take a, a point and then you get so many points for it. And so then you go through to the next one and it gives you five different ones before you get a final score. Um, because I, at times you don't get many clues, I actually spent a little bit of time playing earlier until I got a, a really good one that does show at times, um, oh, what's going on here, as you 
sort of can scroll around and sometimes you'll actually see really good clues like a sign so you can get up a little bit closer see the sign says something in there potulese and so then basically you can go and search for it find out that it's a village in Poland and then actually sort of go about getting yourself closer in to where you think it is. Um, I've used it lots and lots with classes, sometimes with a sort of time limit on how long they have, and sometimes giving them as much time as they want to be able to go away and, and search through it so that they can get as close as possible and get the highest possible score. Um, and if we just click there, it's close enough. And so you can see there 4,800 points as compared to the first guess that you know sort of wasn't quite as as much in the first game I did. Um, but the to me the really powerful thing with teaching with these is the other version of it, which is GeoSetter. And so on this one, basically you set the locations for the quiz that the um, that the kids are, are going to have, have their way through. So if there's some type of case study that you're working on, um, whether you're looking at big landmarks around the world, so you're going to set that across all different places. For me, I, as a geography teacher, um, I quite often teach about Bali as a tourism destination. So if I was to use this for Bali, you can if you know the actual coordinates, you can put them straight in, but otherwise you can come on down here and um, so for example, if you're doing Bali as tourism, well you've got to talk about Kuta Beach of course. So you can zoom on in, grab the little man. Uh, probably don't want it right on the beach. Maybe so that you can give them a location like this. So it's right down on Kuta Beach, a pretty typical kind of One minute. night scene. And say so you set that as round one, and then you can find your next location and set that as at the temple. And so, so then they get basically the same thing as when you're doing a GeoGuessr quiz is what they is what the students see see as their version of it, but it's based upon what you've been studying in class. Thank you, Steve. I must say that is actually really cool. I'd seen GeoGuessr but not GeoSetter, so I love it how you can actually pinpoint to specific learning that you're doing in the classroom. So thank you for sharing that. Do any of our other presenters have anything they'd like to say? Have you used GeoGuessr or GeoSetter in your classrooms and think of any other ways that you could integrate it? I also just like using it um, as a bit of a mix-up in between lessons to um, get the students' attention back and focus. Sometimes it's a good little, quick little quiz and a bit of fun before we get going again. So that's another way I like to use it. So thank you, Steve, for sharing that. Oh, next. next up is myself. So um, I'll just get my screen ready. All right. All right, can you all see my screen? Yes? No, not yet. Oh, did I not click it? Oops, I forgot to click it. I apologise. All right, can you all see my screen now? Yep. Beautiful. I'll start the timer. I'll get started. Okay, so last month I spoke about formatting your life using Google Spreadsheets and today I'm going to take it one step further to share with you guys my favourite add-on, Fluberoo. So I think it was back in episode 3 where I shared using Google Forms in the classroom and so this is something that I've continued to use and through the use of Fluberoo has made my life as a teacher a lot easier. 
So here you can see I've created a simple um, Google form. We complete a PAT reading test and the students have multiple choice where they have to shade it in in a piece of paper, then I'd have to take it home, correct it, then I'd have to analyze it and it would be a whole circle and take me a few days. Where with this, the students would get this form this is what the form looks live and as they're going through the test they just select the correct answers. Then what the Google form does is it puts the results straight away into a spreadsheet and then I have, I've just changed the students names here, then I have all my student data of when they've entered it, their class and the questions. So once I have all this data in, I simply go to add-ons at the top up here and then I go to Fluberoo. Now I've already installed Fluberoo, but if you haven't, you just simply go to Get Add-ons. It will open up, and you can select Fluberoo and add it. So if I wanted to add workflows, I just add it, and it's free. So once I click on Fluberoo, I go into Grade Assignment. So in clicking Grade Assignment. I can see at the bottom of my page it says it's working and it comes up with, from memory, three simple steps. So step one is selecting the grade options. So we know first name identifies student, last name, class, the date it skips and then it gives one point per question. You can change this depending on the type of quiz you have shared. Another great thing is if you don't use a Google form and you enter your data in yourself manually, this also works. Then what you do is hit continue and it takes you to step two. So then from step two, it asks you to select the answers. So as a teacher, I submitted the answers myself. So that was the top one. I select that and hit continue and it works and it says grading your assignment and within three simple clicks at the bottom of my once it's working, Fluberoo grading is complete, view grades. I can see now down the bottom of my sheet from student submissions and grades, it's opened up a new sheet. So straight away it shows me the possible answers, the average points and the counted submission. Then what I can see is it highlights students in red that are at risk and it gives me the percentages total marks. Then what it does as well, I'm just going to hide these because they're annoying me. Then what I can also do is I can scroll across and it highlights questions where my students were low in. So then I can direct my teaching straight away. Just like with spreadsheets that I shared last week, I can also rank my students according to grades. So by clicking on the little arrow at the top, I can select sort and it sorts them from lowest to highest so then I've got my grouping as well and I can target my teaching according to their questions that they got right or wrong. And that is Fluberoo and I've got 13 seconds left to spare so really advise teachers to do it, it automatically grades, you can see the growth and it's as quick as that, the students do it and within two, three clicks it's done so massive time saver as a teacher. All right, let me get back to the hangout. Alrighty, so does anyone have any questions? Does anyone else use Fluberoo in their classrooms? Very quiet tonight everyone. I know. Um, I must admit I've never used it before but um, yeah it seems really useful and something that I'm probably going to try and incorporate into my classroom as well. Yeah. It's really easy. Um, I find it just saves me going home and doing all the correction, then entering the data and then analyzing it again. It just does it for you. And any, I think as teachers, as we said earlier, we're very time poor. So anything that can save us a little bit of time is worth um, using. And especially, I'm in the primary classroom, so we give out a test one day, and we're supposed to start teaching pretty much the next day. So that's a lot of correcting, a lot of organizing what you're going to focus your teaching on, and Using Fluberoo, especially in maths for pre and post testing, it simplifies it, it makes it easy and you can also add images and videos and every, um, actually I don't think you can add videos, I think I made that up, but you can add a whole range of things in the Google form um, to help with the assessment. So yeah, make sure you check out Fluberoo. 
All right, Corey, you're next. Let me know when you're ready for the timer. Well, yeah, we'll just get ready. Um. Okay, can you see that? Uh, yep, perfect. I can see my face. Beautiful. There we go. Okay, um, so tonight what I wanted to speak a little bit about and I suppose to share with the masses is that one of the big things that I try and I preach with the staff that I work with is that you know, I find it really, really engaging for our kids if, if teachers try and create some sort of online learning space um, for them to get engaged with. Um, there are so many different types and, and variations out there for, for teachers to use um, and for kids to engage with, um, for, for parents to be able to access and, and converse and collaborate. Um, and to discuss all a matter of things. Um, and one of those tools that I've, I've found to be really beneficial, I suppose, in the past is a, is a website called Wix. And basically Wix is a, is a site that lets you create websites and lets you create websites exceptionally easy. Um, we have a lot of things such as Edmodo, um, Schoology, and especially Google Classroom, and all three of those as examples are, are outstanding and fantastic. Um, however, I find that they're very internal. They, they don't allow you to publish to a wider audience all that well and I think that if if teachers are going to go to the effort of creating online spaces for themselves, for their students, um, for their school communities, um, you know personally my philosophy is that we try and make that as, as public as possible um, because we really want to share and I don't think we do it enough um, as educators, well, I suppose the world over and that is share the fantastic things that we do day in day out within our classrooms. Um, and within especially our schools. So we're very good at, at, I think, looking at it from an internal perspective but not so much an external perspective. Um, over the past, and as some examples, we've used things like blogs for, for teachers to, to deliver content to students which, which have been public, which have been fantastic. And, he, and an example here is a bit like a, um, a bit like a flipped classroom model. So students would, would watch the videos that the teachers had created prior to, to the lessons taking place. You know, things like Google Sites for specific classes and then more recently um, using another tool such as Weebly which is very similar to Wix um, to create online shared spaces for, for our students. Um, one of the reasons I like Wix is because Wix is fantastically easy to use. Um, fantastically, I'm not even sure that's a word, I think I made that up. Um, it's, it's exceptionally simple um, no matter if no matter what your uh, ability is in using technology, that's for sure. Um, so one example that I have tonight is that um, Wix, you sign up for a free account. Um, obviously, like most things online these days, there are paid versions. Um, but the free account is, I've found, to be all you need. Um, once you sign up with your with your free account, and you can use your, your Google credentials to sign up for that account, um, you then get brought to your dashboard where you can then select a template um, as the basis to create your website. Um, and from there, all the hundreds of different templates are fully customizable. Um, so from what you see there, um, obviously different categories for different websites are fantastic. Um, and as I said, you can fully customize the layout and the look of each website. And you can make it as in-depth or as simple as you like. Um, one that I've been working on recently, flicking all over the shop here. I'll go back to my sites quickly. Uh, and that's killing me. Uh, bear with me for a sec. Is one that I've been working on with my staff around um, our digital learning and trying to get staff to, I suppose, engage with digital learning practices a little bit more often. So this has been developed fully within Wix. Um, I've received great feedback from not only the staff within our school but from staff at other schools as well who've used this as a resource. Um, you can sort of see the tabs across the top. We have a, a blog that, that I add to, um, that I try and get other students and kids to add to as well, um, which is really beneficial. We have a lot of stuff around our iPads use, a lot of stuff Ten around our Google Lab. Thank you. And um, obviously there's links here for professional learning. So for staff who are wanting to engage in professional learning, I suppose outside the school setting, they have that ability to, um, to hit that up as well. So it's a website very much worth um, investigating and, and looking into. It's terrific. Wonderful. Thank you, Corey, and I apologize on the timing. I um, muted myself and then I said I paused the timing while you were signing in and then 
I realized I was muted, so apologies on that. But Wix does look fantastic. I've just got a question. Is there, a, I'm a primary teacher, is there an age limit? Is it 13 plus? Um, honestly, I, that's not something I've looked into, to be honest. Okay, no um, problem. But in, in, I suppose in saying that, it depends on the content you're putting up there too. We don't use kids' first names and that kind of thing, so yeah, uh, yeah, it depends on the purpose. Yep. No, thank you. I was just wondering, just from a primary yeah. teacher perspective, that always comes up. Um, does anyone? Do you, yeah, Corey, how do you compare um, Wix with Weebly? Um, I think that Wix is a lot more for me. Um, I'm all about the visual. I think that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. With Wix, it's a lot more, I suppose, aesthetically pleasing to the eye. And you can do a lot more with it. Um, the only difference is that I find with Weebly, you can have multiple users on one website with Weebly, whereas you can't with Wix, which I find is its only downfall. So with some of the Weeblys that I'm starting to see created at my college at the moment, um, kids are having their own logins and they're adding to those pages and they're adding to the website, whereas now if I was to do that um, across multiple staff or multiple students, I'd all have to give them the same, the same login credentials or details which we, as we know, can get a little bit messy. So that's probably the biggest difference I've noticed. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. And um, I've actually just realised I forgot to share the slide to vote. So I'll just quickly share that before we swing over to you, Michael. So don't forget to vote for our wonderful presenters tonight. It's the same bit.ly as most um, months. It's bit.ly forward slash capital TTP, lowercase e9, lowercase vote. And if, you're ha if you have trouble with this, you can just go to the Teach Tech Play website and it's on the home page or on the episode page. So you have till Friday to vote for your favourite presenter. Alrighty, and now we will head over to my co-host who is doing a little bit of YouTube hints. So I'd like to know what hints you have for me, Michael, in using YouTube. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'll just quickly share my screen. Can you see that? Yes, off you go. I'll Fantastic. start the timer. Okay, so um, this sort of um, follows through from Corey's um, presentation about online learning spaces and also um, the flip classroom. Back in episode three, which is the same as Lenny, um, I spoke about a tool called Video Notes, which links to Google Drive and allows you, as you're watching a YouTube video, to be able to make notes and that correspond to a particular time on the video. So if I was to click on um, back on the 30 second mark, it would then jump automatically to the 30 second mark of that video. So it allows students to be able to watch a video um, and make some notes and direct, automatically save in their Google Drive for them, which is really handy. Now, one couple of um, extra tips that I've learned while watching um, sorry, while reading Mike Reading's blog from Using Technology Better, one of the things that I found really useful was the ability in settings to be able to speed up or slow down a video that you're watching. So if I was to click on the settings icon again and under speed, you can actually make a video run a lot faster, which is really handy when you're watching a long tutorial video and all you want to do is to speed up the process. So I'm going to give you a look um, my headphone and play this our episode one on one and a half speed. It's about Google Maps. So let me uh, share my screen. I think there's so many cool ways to integrate uh, geo technology into your classroom. So give me a second. I'm going to start my own timer just to make sure Lenny's not cheating. Um, and we'll go from here. Hold on one second. Okay. I love um Every episode just relates back to Lenny cheating about um, her time. We're working on the timer. So um, that's a really good um, feature to use when you're watching a long video or just a tutorial you want to see speed up a little bit. Another one feature that some people might not know is the subtitle feature, which, um, as I found, automatically would grab the voice um, audio, sorry, the audio tune from YouTube and any videos and try to, like Siri, um, convert that audio into words. So if I was to play yeah, that now... Uh, I don't cheat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to be sure. All right, so uh, hopefully you can see me. I can see you guys. So, uh, you know, Google, you can go ahead and start. Google has so many cool ways of integrating Google Maps.
So that was Jim um, explaining about giving us tips on Google Maps, but as you can see down the bottom here, it automatically gives us a subtitle of the video and all the words that's been spoken. Now, it's not 100% perfect at the moment, but for students, it's really handy if sometimes they're missing out on different spots. Another great feature that I've found is... Um, One minute. Fantastic. Um, is that if you use the number key on your keyboard, between one and zero, it will automatically actually jump to different spots of your video. So if I was to press five, that would jump to the middle of the video. Or if I press zero, it will jump to the start. And nine, it will jump towards the end. You can also, if you want to jump to certain parts of the video, if you're sharing a video with your students, on the address bar up here, you can actually type in a hashtag, T equals, and type in a time and when a student type in the address, you'll automatically jump to a certain time of the video. Now, last of all, I'm just going to delete that hashtag for the minute. If I was to type in, for the YouTube word, a GIF, it would take me to a website where you can create automatic, an animated GIF of the actual, of any YouTube video that you like. So here's an example that I've created earlier of the five second animated GIF of the paper plane hitting a soccer player in the soccer match. And there you go. That's Thank you, some Michael. Hints. Now I must say the other day I was watching YouTube and there were subtitles and I could not work out how I got it. So now I've worked out how I have subtitles. I must have accidentally clicked something. It was driving me insane. I was like, why did every video got subtitles all of a sudden? So I know that some of those tips and hints will be very helpful. Um, and does anyone else have anything to say to Michael? No, it's always good playing around with YouTube. I was just going to ask if the subtitles worked with any video rather than just ones that you're the you know that you control. But it seems like, seeing as you did it by mistake, it must be anyone can do it. Yep, anyone can do it. But what I found is that um, at the moment, it only really pick up an American accent um, better than most. So that's why I actually skipped to Jim's um, little bit. Yeah, so they, I think Siri and any voice recording love the American accent. They don't quite like our Australian or New Zealand accent, but hopefully they can work on that. And so luckily last, but save the best to last, I think, or well, personally, that's my personal favourite is Hapara Teacher Dashboard. Lemba's going to share um, how fantastic this tool is, and if you're using Google Apps in your classroom, I definitely recommend you get on board. It is a massive time saver. When you're ready, Lemba. Thanks so much. I'm just going to grab my screen. So, can you see my screen? It's yes. Great. Okay. So, um, so have for a teacher dashboard. This is a management tool for your Google Apps. So, if you are getting a little bit frustrated trying to find student work in the shared with me part of your drive, or trying to find um, what your students are doing at the moment in their Google Apps, then um, then this is where you need to be. Um, coming into your dashboard, uh, you would um, see the classes that you teach and you can go into any of those classes you, you teach. What loads up for you is a, is a bird's eye view of your class. So now um, you can look into some folders that are automatically created in your students' drive for you. You don't have to make folders. Teacher Dashboard makes them all for you. And, um, and the folders that they make that you choose to make um, are listed on the dashboard here. So the view you're looking at now is we're looking into a folder called Reading for all of the students in your class. And in that um, folder, we can see the, um, the files or the documents that they have filed in their reading folder. I'm looking at three by default, but if I want to see more than three, I can view up to 25 um, within these student panels. 
Um, if I want to quickly uh, see some of the work they're doing, I can hover over any of these document names. I get a thumbnail of what the document looks like. I can see some metadata about that document, um, who else it's been shared with, when it was last viewed, updated. Um, but the, the exciting thing is, is one single click takes you straight to any um, file at all. It doesn't have to be a Google Doc, just anything that's in the drive. And automatically you have got um, permissions on these documents. So you can you have automatic permissions to be able to um, comment or edit um, directly onto the document. So that means as to you as a teacher is that never again do your students have to share documents with you. Everything your students do in their drive now, you will have access to, even unshared documents. So if they're just leaving documents just sitting in the drive, not in a folder, you can just go to the sharing tab and you can view unshared documents here under the unshared tab. So these are now um, documents that all of these students have not shared with me, I'm the teacher, um, but I can still see them, I can still um, get the information, I can still click into them, and I have full editing permissions on, on these um, unshared documents as well as documents that are in the drive. Just a little slow to load there, I'll go back. Um, as well as that, you can push documents out to students. So using a smart, the smart share um, icon, you can just push out anything out of your drive, any file, video, PowerPoint, as long as it's in your drive. Or you can push out blank documents. You can push these out um, up to five at a time to multiple classes. So if you teach more than one class, you can send to multiple classes, or you can send it to students in your class, um, or you can send it to groups that you might have made. So you can use um, the grouping tool to make reading groups, writing groups, math groups. One etc. minute. Great, thank you. Um, and then you can send out documents um, to those groups. So if you had a, a, a group that you're working with, those documents can go directly to them. Um, as well as that, even though I've only talked about Docs so far, Docs is not just limited to Docs and Drive. If it's a Google app, then you're able to see it on the dashboard. So if the students are using Google Sites, using Blogger, um, even Gmail, whatever they're doing in Google, you will have a dashboard view and you will be able to access, read, edit any of those, um, those Google apps that they're working on. So um, Harper Teacher Dashboard, there are some extra modules in here, um, bits and pieces that allow you to see what they're doing on Chrome, um, allow you to see any tabs that they've got open. Um, so I've got a student here who's already preloaded, and I can see that the student, Karita, has got three tabs open um, on, her, on her Chrome device. Um, I can see uh, the screen she's looking at, if I want to, I can just go to the screen view and see the screen she's looking at. I can remotely open and close tabs on her device, and I can um, and I can send messages directly to her. So there's her screen; you can see exactly what she's looking at. So thanks, that's Harper Teacher Dashboard. Thanks, Lenny. Thanks, Lenva. And I must say, in four minutes, it must be <laughs> a <laughs> to get through it because I know I could just watch you going on and on and. That's just a quick snapshot of what Hapara does. Um, I think for teachers, the versatility of just being able to send a document out to all students or a template that they can just start working on and they don't have to go and make a copy. And I know even having access to Gmail and seeing their screens and sending out tabs and it's just a good monitoring process. Yeah. And last year when I was in a Chromebook classroom, I remember being in a class, especially teaching Year 6 boys, they love to go exploring through YouTube when they shouldn't. So I used to keep the interact up on the um, board and so I didn't even have to patrol. I had all the students oh, exactly. and say, what are they doing on YouTube? I said, oh, I don't know. Thank you. I'll take your Chromebook. So I think it's a great tool for classroom yeah. management. Yeah, and absolutely. I think all our presenters tonight use I know, Steve, you do. Corey, does your school use the Power Teacher Dashboard? No, but after seeing that, I want to. <laughs> yes, you need to. I'll call it later. <laughs> and um, Lemba, there is a cost to using Hapara, but it's yeah, not a big cost for what yeah, it is. So, yeah. what's the cost again? Um, well, in Australia, if you're in Australian dollars, it's five Australian dollars. So it's in local currency wherever you are in the world. Um, so yeah, it's just a minimum cost. Um, a lot of schools put it on the stationery list. So yeah, around yeah. four, four US or five Australian, depending yeah. where you are. 
Yeah. So it's really worth it. I know to the interact part is a couple dollars more. So that's for, right. Yeah, that's an optional module. Mm. Yep. And to have it, I think it's just fantastic. The sharing and the versatility. So that actually brings us. Did anyone else have any questions for Lemba? I know I. Yeah, I do. Um, Lemba, can you have multiple teachers? for a particular class? Yes, absolutely. As many teachers as you like. It's, yes. Yeah, and students in multiple classes as well. Okay. Yep. Yeah, it's really good. I recommend it. Um, so that ends our show for tonight. And I know that there are some great things. And I saw from the tweets that there are a few people saying, there's so much I want to try. So I know Lemba's um, available and just get in contact with her via their website and any of our presenters if you've got any questions just um, hit them up over Twitter I'm sure they'll be happy to help you out. Our next show is in a couple of weeks because of Easter it's not that long and we've got a great show coming I haven't advertised it yet it'll be advertised in the next couple of days but I'll announce the presenters tonight we've got Wes Warner from Australia Mike Reading who was in Australia but now he's living in New Zealand and we've also got Mark Anderson from the UK so that will be a great show and I'm really looking forward to it please make sure you vote for your favorite presenter tonight um, there's the link to vote Voting is open till 8 p.m. on Friday, so I know it's holidays for a lot of people in Australia and I think Americans are still on sh spring break, um, so try and get your votes in. We'd love um, to hear what everyone thinks. One other thing, over the last couple of weeks, we reached over 5,000 followers on Twitter, so we'd like to th ha shout out to all you teachers and educators out there following us, a huge thank you, we really appreciate it. Without you guys this show wouldn't happen so please make sure you continue to vote and share what we have to offer here. I don't know who just did that but thank you. Um, yeah, so we look forward to seeing you for episode 10 that is on Monday the 4th of May. So hope everyone has a great time and we'll see you then. Bye. <laughs>